Welcome, everyone. Thank you for walking. This is a long way to our talk. And thank you for attending the talk uh, late in the, in the day. We know that the first day of Kubecon is, yeah, it's challenging. So today we are, um, we are talking about a cluster API deep dive. And we are talking about how we work to improve the cluster API performance up to 2,000 clusters. Uh, first, let's uh, introduce ourselves. I'm Fabrizio Pandini. I work at OneWare, and I'm a C cluster lifecycle tech lead and a cluster API maintainer. Yeah, I'm Stefan Büdinger. I also work for, work for VMware. I'm cluster API and controller time maintainer. Good, great. Uh, before starting, so um, today what we are talking about is uh, a work that we did uh, for cluster API 1.5.0. So it means more or less this summer. And um, what is interesting about this work is, is that we are talking about um, a series of, uh, of concepts or uh, experience or lesser learning that not, not only apply to cluster API or cluster API providers, but can be useful for uh, everyone developing controller on Kubernetes. Um, the presentation today is kind of divided in, into part. The first part will be a very brief introduction on the tool that you need to do uh, performance uh, scalability optimization. The second part will be a deep dive on how we basically manage to scale cluster API up to 2,000 clusters. OK. So let's get started. So the first step is uh, you have to get the right uh, tools for the job. Um, we're going relatively quickly over some of those so that we can focus on the more important parts later on. So uh, the first things you need is uh, metrics, uh, profiling, tracing, and logs. Um, ideally, uh, so we have like a priority list on the right side, essentially. So the first thing is definitely that you need metrics, because otherwise you can measure anything. Um, but what you also need is um, automation. And what we mean with autom automation here is essentially that um, you will have to run some sort of scale tests. And ideally, you don't do it manually, of course. So you need um, yeah, automation for your scale test. Uh, and if possible, you should also use mocks. So in cluster API, usually we, we create clusters and machines in some real clouds. And of course, it's a lot better if you just use a mock, because you don't, you don't actually have to pay for the infrastructure, et cetera. So why do we need those tools? So the first four, metrics, profiling, tracing, and logs, um, we mostly need them to analyze performance um, and to investigate bottlenecks. Uh, the first two, metrics and profiling, they're more for getting like a rough overview or like a lot of reconciles just to get data, like average reconcile duration, et cetera, uh, while we use tracing and logs more like to dig into like specific slow reconciles and try to figure out basically where we're losing the time. Then for automation, um, the important part is essentially we're running our scale test automated so that we can um, observe the performance, we can optimize it, we can run the test again, we can see how much we improve. Um, and of course, um, once we did our optimizations, we just try to run them periodically so that we don't run into any regressions um, yeah, once we implement new features and other stuff. Um, yeah, and the mocks, uh, I already mentioned it before, but the most important part essentially um, is to, to increase speed. Um, so that you don't actually have to wait for real infrastructure to come up. You can just decide in our mock how, far, how long does it take to create a machine or whatever you want to do. And of course, to reduce costs. Because we're talking about really a huge amount of clusters, a huge amount of machines, and you don't actually want to pay for the inf infrastructure. Next. OK, let's take a closer look at metrics. So uh, we basically made our own categories here. So uh, we, are, we separate them in user facing and in um, internal metrics or system metrics. The idea is basically that user-facing metrics are actually metrics describing what a user cares about. So things like, how long does it take to create a machine, delete a machine, create a cluster? Um, and we use them to define goals and to measure our success. So the really important part is that you have metrics describing what a user cares about, and those are the ones we're trying to optimize. Then we have internal metrics, and we use internal metrics um, to take a, basically a deeper look into the system and try to figure out um, why the user-facing metrics are not looking that good. So an example is uh, we're looking at average reconcile durations of our controllers, about work queue, memory usage, CPU usage, uh, number of go routines, that sort of stuff. So basically we use them to understand a little bit better how our system works and try to pinpoint what you have to optimize. OK, so how can you get all of this? <laughs> so the good news is, use is um, you get almost all of it for free, because at least with cluster API. Because we already did a lot of that work, uh, we have a lot of stuff just upstream in the repository and can mostly use it. For you, for, so for user-facing metrics, um, the idea is, in our case, that we essentially infer those metrics from CRDs. So we have our cluster, our machine, et cetera, our CRDs. 
and we just give essentially kubesat matrix a config so that it can infer certain metrics from those CRDs. So basically your cluster object already contains the information, <coughs> how long it takes to create a machine and that sort of stuff, and we just infer it from there. For internal metrics, um, we're using the metric server included into control runtime, and we're getting essentially out of the box uh, control runtime metrics, client go metrics, and go metrics. And um, essentially for all of those, we have a configuration upstream, and you can just use it. And one bonus on top is that we also already have dashboards. So for example, we have a control runtime dashboard, which should work with every control runtime based controller. And you don't have to do anything, just deploy our stuff, scrape the metrics, and that's it. Uh, then for profiling, we are also using uh, the metric server included into the control runtime. And uh, then we use Parser to regularly scrape the metrics from our, <coughs> sorry, uh, from our uh, profile endpoint. Then for tracing, you actually have to do some work. So you have to instrument your controller. Um, but you can focus on the ones which are actually slow and just add more and more over time. Um, here we do it similar as for metrics. Basically, we have Parker running. And Parker, Parker regularly uh, just gets the profiles from the, sorry, <coughs> uh, from our controllers and stores them so that we can take a look over time how our profiles evolve. Um, then for logs, um, you hopefully already have logs. Um, and basically, if you see during your investigation that you need more logs, you can just add more. But in general, um, it's probably good enough what you already have. And we are using um, Promptail to ship the logs to Loki. And then, um, essentially, uh, we take a look at the logs via Grafana. Um, yeah. Uh, the nice thing is because we are uh, showing logs and traces via Grafana, um, we can basically cross-correlate them. So we can see which traces are matching with which logs and investigate um, via reconcise or slow. Uh, then automation. Uh, here, similar as above, you probably already have some sort of end-to-end -end tests, and you can basically extend them to just have scale tests by uh, creating a lot of clusters, in our case, a lot of clusters at the same time, and then you have your scale test. Um, and for mocks, uh, that's a bit more work. So what we did essentially is we implement an um, entire fake infrastructure provider, uh, which creates clusters and machines uh, just in memory and simulates um, an entire workload cluster, essentially. Great. So we, now, uh, we can now enter in the, in the core of the presentation and basically talk uh, about how we scaled up cluster API to 2,000 cluster. So the first step, which is more important than, than what people usually think, is to define a goal. And we use the metric, uh, the cluster provisioning time, and we define uh, our, our goal uh, uh, in this way. So the cluster provisioning time must, must remain almost constant from the first cluster till the last cluster. So we want this time to be constant uh, uh, scaling up. And yeah, guess what? We did it. So at the end, basically, uh, if you compare the average provisioning time from the first 100 machine to the last 100 machine, there is a neglectable increase of the 2%. And uh, as you can see, all, all, all during the test, uh, the provisioning time was all, almost constant. Uh, I remember we were using a uh, uh, in memory provider, cluster provisioning is just above one minute. So we were going very, very, very fast. We were really being aggressive. Uh, this is great. We managed to do it. But the, I think the most interesting part, and this is what we want to talk about in the next slide, is how we manage basically to keep cluster API performance, to keep the system responsive from why scaling up and also after scaling up while, while running at scale. And in order to do so, it is important to have a common understanding a common, uh, of uh, how controller works. And this is what we're talking in the next slide. Yeah. So basically, starting with really like uh, controller basics. So let's just first take a look how a controller actually works. Um, that's really a simplified view, just to be clear. <laughs> uh, so basically, what we have is um, we have um, uh, events coming from the API server, so objects are getting created, updated, or deleted. They are essentially enqueued uh, in the queue, and then we have um, some workers uh, continuously uh, taking elements from the objects from the queue and reconciling them. 
Um, we can have multiple workers, which we call here concurrency. And yeah, that's the basic model. One more? Ah, okay. Um, and the main performance characteristic of a controller is essentially um, the latency between uh, an object getting created, updated, or deleted, and until it's successfully reconciled. Yeah. Um, so we uh, set up this formula here, which is basically uh, the number of objects in a queue divided by the concurrency, and then multiplied with the reconciled duration. So a very simple example. Let's say we have 2,000 clusters. Uh, we have 10 workers, which means every worker has to reconcile through 200 clusters. And if every one of those takes three seconds, then we need 10 minutes uh, just to reconcile through 2,000 clusters. <coughs> so you might ask yourself, is that like a real realistic scenario that we have all of them at the same time in the queue? Uh, the answer is yes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, because Control Random has something called a periodic resync, which essentially means um, when this resync happens, uh, every single existing object that we have, in those case, um, every single cluster, is getting enqueued in the queue. Uh, on top of that, um, we also have sometimes the case that basically our reconcile uh, code at the, at the end decides, oh, uh, this cluster is not actually finished, we have to uh, reconcile that one again. Uh, and then we use uh, requeue after, which means it's just get it added back in the queue. Um, so basically the important thing is that whenever a requeue happens, uh, sorry, whenever a resync, uh, periodic resync happens, uh, we have to reconcile uh, all the objects in the queue as fast as we can so that the queue is empty again. So just to, uh, oh, sorry. one back. Um, if you look at this diagram, what you can essentially see, um, the peaks are um, re uh, re uh, periodic resynchs, and within like 15 or 30 seconds, uh, we're getting the queue back down to zero. So you can imagine basically if you um, create a new cluster at the peak of this queue, uh, you basically depend on how fast is this queue going back down to zero until your class is actually reconciled. And if that takes like 10 or 20 minutes, um, you won't get anywhere. Because of course, um, one single reconcile is not enough um, until an entire class is created. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what can we do to improve the situation? Um, and yeah, I mean, it's sort of obvious. We have like those three um, options. Uh, we have those three variables going into it. So we can increase the concurrency of our workers. Uh, we can reduce the reconcile duration, and we can uh, reduce the objects in the queue. And that's basically what a large part of this talk is about. Okay, so let's look at uh, how we worked on uh, option one, which is uh, increased concurrency. As, uh, as Stefan just explained, basically, uh, a controller have many workers, and the number uh, running in parallel, the number of, of workers is, is called a concurrency. And the, as you can imagine, if we have only one worker, your, this is not good when you work at performance because your queue gets empty in a very, very slow, in a sequential manner. And so, why not simply increase the number of, of workers? Okay. Well, it, it turns out that this is not a silver bullet because what happened is that the more uh, workers that you have running in parallel, basically the more query, uh, the more things are running, the more uh, you are eating the API server of, of your cluster. So the risk if you increase, if you have too many workers is that, yeah, your queue, your queue get empty fast, but another component of the cluster starts suffering. Mm? So you, ha you have to, to find a good balance. And what we learned is that uh, the default number of workers in cluster API is 10. And we learned that 10 is, 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 is quite good, uh, cover most of the keys. And uh, uh, with 2,000 clusters, it works very well with a um, reconciled loop that take 200, 250 milliseconds in, in this ballpark. And your queue are all, most of the time uh, empty, and when there is a sync, uh, things go, go down in 10, 15 seconds. So this, this is a good value. We increased this value only for one of our reconcilers, which is the Kubernetes control plane. Kubernetes control plane is a very complex uh, reconciler that connects to the workload cluster, so it takes a little bit longer than uh, um, 200 and 250 milliseconds. So we added more workers, but we, really did a lot of work on, on the um, KCP controller in order to make sure that even if we are running with many, uh, with 50 uh, KCP rec uh, reconciling in parallel, we are not uh, uh, creating problem on, on the API server. And then we will explain how we did this. So 
Option one is not a silver bullet. Then we have to move to option two. Option two is basically to reduce the reconciled duration. And as you can imagine, this is a little bit more complex than simply increasing the number of uh, uh, controller running in parallel. Uh, the good news is that uh, we learned that if you follow the leads that your metrics are giving you, the leads that the profiling and tracing are giving you, you can improve performance by doing very small uh, uh, surgical changes. So, and this is really effective when you combine this with uh, mocks and automation because uh, basically you measure, you find a, a bottleneck, you, try, uh, you address it, and, and you repeat. And the next slide is, is about uh, explaining how we did this in Cluster API. So the first step was remove noise. So what, what was happening? When we were starting to scaling up uh, uh, Cluster API above 300, 400 cluster, we were getting a, a lot of noise. Basically, the performance of our controller were not deterministic. And we try, we basically dig into what was going on, and we traced the source of this uh, lack of determinism in, uh, in the client-side rating of client Go. What is the client-side rating? So every client Go client, like our controller, as a mechanism, which is uh, uh, client-side rating, and this mechanism is a safeguard uh, that protects the API server from uh, uh, clients that are too aggressive. It basically ensures the stability of the entire system. So it is a good server to have. And um, in Cast API, the default rate limit is 20 query per second plus uh, uh, 30 uh, query uh, burst. That means that for a small uh, window of time, you can have about 50 query. Mm? But uh, if the number of query keep going, basically rate and limit starting slowing down your query. And this impact your reconciler. Your, your reconciler randomly get picked up to be slowed down. And so uh, your system is, is busy. There is a lot of noise. You don't understand where the issue are. Uh, we basically played a little bit around those numbers, and we found out that for working with 2,000 cluster, uh, it is just enough to, to increase uh, query per second to 100 and uh, burst to 200, um, which is okay in a cluster API management cluster where cluster API itself is the main process running in the, in the, in the cluster. Okay, good. So as soon as we uh, get rid of the noise, the next step is, okay, let's find the first bottleneck, the first reconciler that, that we have to work on. And this was uh, pretty easy because without noise, you, you simply look at the um, reconciled duration uh, metrics that you get from controller runtime, and you pick the, the slowest one. In this case, it is the yellow one that is clearly is, is not performing like the, the others. And uh, the next slide show how, uh, uh, how we, are, we, we work at, uh, once it, uh, we, we know which reconciler we have to improve, then how we can actually improve it. And uh, the first pattern of problem that we start uh, finding out is that uh, when looking at, uh, at profiles, we were seeing uh, uh, slow operation re repeated many times. And uh, if you think about it, it, it is quite common. We as a software engineer, we like to develop a utility, and then we reuse them all around the code. So that means that if you have a utility that does not perform well, you start seeing a pattern like the one shown in this graph, that where, where there is this uh, time-consuming operation which is repeated uh, for time. In this case, it is again the KCP controller, which is uh, connecting to ATCD to first list the member of the cluster and then connect to three members, so four call to ATCD. And what is happening is, is kind of hard to read, is that for each connection, we were creating a private key, which is a time-consuming operation. So how we solve this? Simply by creating one key once, 
and reusing for, for, for many calls. By doing this simple optimization, we, we found similar problem when creating Kubernetes cluster and uh, other kind of expensive operation. But yeah, by using, doing some uh, simple caching, it was possible basically to reduce the reconcile time of this controller by 75%. Okay, so the next thing we found um, were essentially API calls. <laughs> so um, obviously controllers are using clients uh, to talk to the API server and to read and write data. And um, the more complex the controller uh, gets, um, yeah, the more calls we get basically automatically. Um, and uh, that has a huge impact on reconcile durations. Um, one, uh, one reason is um, because of network latency, but also because the API server simply needs time to answer our requests. Um, if you look at this picture, um, that is a trace from the KCP controller, um, and I think that's only a subset of what can happen. <laughs> um, and if you see, like at the at at top of the of the uh, trace, that's basically the like entire reconcile duration. And basically, every bar, which is a little bit wider, is actually an API call. So if you look at this, um, you can say like 80, 90 percent of uh, the reconcile duration of this KCP controller is just doing API calls against the API server. Um, and then the question is essentially, how can we improve this? Um, and ideally, also while improving this, how can we reduce the load on the API server? Um, so first, we have to uh, take a step back and uh, take a look at how the client usually works. So if you just take like a regular client go client, or um, if you, um, yeah, or, yeah, also the, the, if you just create a controller client by yourself, it also does the same thing. <laughs> so um, if you call this client to just in this case, uh, read or write a cluster, it just goes directly to the API server, um, which is obviously not great. Um, what Control Runtime is doing, if you just uh, take the default client that Control Runtime gives you, is that it essentially um, is using a cache for read calls. So the write calls are still going directly to the API server, but all the read calls are just hitting a local cache um, and returning whatever is in that cache. Um, to fill that cache, um, the Control Runtime cache is uh, is running informers and reflectors, which are just listing and watching objects and then storing them in a the local cache. Sorry, in a local store. Um, yeah, so um, in Cluster API in general, we basically use um, this default controller type client almost everywhere, which means um, theoretically, almost all our read calls should be already cached, uh, but it's not that easy. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, I already mentioned it, uh, write calls are never cached, so the only thing we can do about write calls is uh, just trying to make sure that um, if you have a single reconcile, we don't write the same object five times or something like that, because, yeah, uh, that's not really necessary. And for read calls, uh, there's one caveat, and that is essentially, um, if you use the regular types, so like the cluster type or something like that, uh, they are cached by default, but if you use unstructured, they are not cached by default. Uh, you can fix this um, by configuring control runtime accordingly, but yeah, the default behavior is, is basically that they're not cached. Um, and the tricky thing about cluster API, or at least class, core cluster API is um, that most of the objects we're using, we don't actually know them because we just have contracts and then you don't know if that's like an Azure machine or a vSphere machine. So we use unstructured everywhere. And that was a major, major problem uh, for performance. So the biggest improvements we made is just by making sure that uh, we're using um, yeah, caches for read calls um, everywhere. Um, of course, there are uh, there's a trade-off there, and the trade-off is that, of course, your memory usage goes up, um, but it still seemed reasonable for us. So when we were using, um, when we had like the environment with 2,000 clusters, we had like something between two and four gigabytes of memory usage for a core controller, which seems fine. Um, of course, it depends a little bit on how big your clusters are, the exact topology, but in general, it seemed like a worthy trade-off. And then, of course, we're using a cache, so the standard problem is uh, that the objects in the cache can be stale. Um, but um, I mean, we took a closer look at all the places where we changed this, um, and it, I would say in general it's fine, because what usually happens is that even if your cache is stale, um, at some point you will get an update event for uh, that cache, uh, for the stale object, and then you will get another reconcile which eventually um, reconciles like with the up-to-date state of your object. So that wasn't really a problem for us to just use the cache area. Okay, so, we we basically talked about uh, increasing concurrency. We talked about how to improve uh, reconcile time. The third option is to reduce the number of objects in the queue. And uh, if you remember for the previous slide, we don't have full control on this one. For sure, we cannot control how many clusters the user is changing, upgrading, or creating, or deleting. For sure, we cannot control uh, the controller runtime or sync. Yeah, eventually we can make a sync less frequent, but 
sooner or later a resync has to happen. And, and so the only things that we can control is how uh, our controller add uh, back co object to the queue. And it, it turns out that the controller, uh, when you develop a controller and your reconcile finish, you can basically return three type of answer. One is success. Uh, my object is up, up to desired state, forget about it. The other two are uh, requeue uh, with back off and uh, requeue after. So how we use them? So we use a requeue with back off for errors. And this is fine because when, when your system has an error, you want that the system recover very fast. And, but if the error is, is persistent, basically you want that, that your system reduce the frequency of a try. And because the error is persistent and does not make sense to keep hammering the, the, the system with new query. Uh, the, 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 the last option is requeue after. And when we are using it, for instance, in Class API, we provide machine. And when you create a machine, then you, behind the scene of, of when get created. And so a way to wait for the machine being created is that every 10 seconds, you basically go and check if the machine is there. Hmm? But if you keep doing this polling at scale, what happens is that your system basically continue to run this reconciled loop that are just checking for something to happen. And at scale, this, this creates noise, this creates a load, load of your system. So what is the better way to do this is to use watches. Uh, you, you can think of watch like a notification. It's like uh, when you instruct the VM that whenever the VM gets ready, it sends a notification back to your machine controller. And this, this notification is just another event in the queue. And, and this allows you to keep your system idle, doing nothing while you're waiting, and then when something gets happening in your system, you just react. And this is actually a, a good way to reduce uh, what we have in the queue. Okay, so uh, reconcile best practices. Um, that's basically like a simplified view of how reconcile you, uh, loop usually works. Um, at the beginning, we're reading the, the current state um, and also the desired state. Um, then we compare the current of the desired state and then we align um, to the desired state by, by writing something in some way. Um, so in the first phase, uh, what we would recommend is um, that try to read um, all the objects that you, I would say, usually need for most of your code paths. Um, so you have them available and you can basically just pass them through to the functions where you need them because if you don't do that, usually you just try to read them at the various places uh, multiple times. Um, and yeah, that's not really great, especially if you're not using um, client caching. Um, then definitely try to use client caching whenever you can. So the difference really microseconds to milliseconds um, from just reading low cache versus actually going against API server. Um, but be aware of the caching caveats and ideally really run, run the scale tests, uh, look at the traces, see if you're actually using the cache. Um, that, that really helps. Um, then in the second phase, um, just try to avoid um, duplicate expense operations, so like the example we had before. So generating private keys is um, definitely something that you should not repeat if you can avoid it. Um, and yeah, whatever expensive things you're doing, probably ju uh, just take a look at the profile um, and it should tell us, uh, should tell you um, where you're wasting your time and, and if there's something repeated in there. Um, then uh, try to write only once per reconcile. So the, what we're usually doing in, in cluster API for the current object that we reconcile is just at the beginning of a reconcile function, we have basically a defer so that um, whenever that reconcile uh, finishes in some way, it doesn't matter if it's an error or not, we just do one patch call to this object. Um, but the same applies to, to other objects that you potentially write, just try to minimize the write calls there. And then, uh, if applicable, just try uh, to use watches um, instead of constantly requeuing with something like 10 seconds or so. Uh, doesn't always work, but in a lot of cases, you can just avoid a lot of um, unnecessary reconciles. Okay, great. If you follow these best practices, your controller are kind of performed out of the box, but then if you really have to do optimization, there is a list of do and don'ts. So first do is get the right tool of the job. Without metric, it's not possible to do uh, performance improvement. Without uh, automation, it, it, uh, doing performance improvement become very long and not effective and it costs money. Uh, define measured goals, because at every iteration you, you can check uh, uh, if you're making progress or not, and you can also define uh, when, when you, you are done. Uh, 
uh, invest time in learning how controller runtime and client go works because they provide the tool to improve performance. And the last do is uh, iterate fast, do small changes, and then look at the system because every, sometime a small change just change the behavior of your system and it does not make sense to make a big action or big plan. Just small change, remove one button, and like measure again, repeat, repeat, and uh, as fast as you can. Don't do is don't do optimization if there is if you don't have a matrix that point clearly to a bottleneck, because if you change code based on guessing or whatever you risk that your system become less performant or you risk to introduce unnecessary bugs. And with that, we are done. I think that before opening up for question, uh, I would like to thank you a couple of contributors that really helped in, in this effort. Uh, Christian Slaughter, which basically is driving all, all the work for generating metrics out of CRD, and this work can be reused by everyone for every CRD, we would like to thank you, uh, Lennart, uh, because it triggered a lot of discussion about how to optimize uh, controllers. And uh, we would like to thank you, Kilian and Yuvaraji, because they really helped in building up the automation and the mock provider that, that made, made it possible basically to implement, to do all, all this, this job in, in three weeks. And thank you everyone again for attending. If you, are, if you have questions, we are looking for them. Yeah, I think you have to work, work through the microphone. <laughs> you have questions? It's on. Uh, I, I think that one of the topology controllers was one of the first to use server-side apply. I saw in that last slide, or one of the last slides, that one of the ways you control how many times you write per reconcile loop is using a deferred patch. We do the same thing and have, in various cases, run into some awkwardness, interact, like in, awkward interactions between a deferred patch and server-side apply. Do you guys know if you ran into anything similar? I can take that on the show. So uh, we didn't really mention what we did with server-side apply because that happened like, I don't know, half a year ago or something. Um, so topology control is a really special case in cluster API. Um, so we did our totally different custom solution to, um, to make this performant. <laughs> um, essentially what we're doing is uh, we're getting like the current state, we're computing the desired state, and then we do some sort of hashing to figure out if, if we even have to do a server-side apply and we avoid it at all costs. And that is basically the thing that makes uh, topology controller performant that in a lot of cases we just don't do anything <laughs> because we just know that nothing changed, so there is no reason um, to apply again. So that's, that's definitely no defer patch, nothing in there. It's um, basically a custom cache that we built there, which tries to figure out if we even have to yeah. uh, do a service of deployment. I, I think this, the summary is that if you can avoid uh, an operation, it is the best of the individual that you can do. And so we avoid the server side apply whenever we can. So thank you for the uh, talk. I think a lot of uh, useful learnings out of how to optimize the controller in general. Uh, my question is more towards um, the uh, cluster API project. Um, there is a uh, open source uh, project that was introduced inside uh, uh, the uh, CN, uh, CF um, called Open Cluster Management, OCM. So I really like to know if you guys have looked at that and what is the difference between OCM and Cluster API? Because both are saying that um, we manage and maintain clusters, Kubernetes clusters or... Uh, to be honest, I uh, asked exactly that question at the last KubeCon at the Open Cluster Management kiosk and I don't remember. <laughs> Um, if I remember correctly, um, open cluster management is used in some Red Hat products and well, potentially in combination with cluster API. But maybe just after the talk, uh, just ask like uh, Vince or someone sitting around there. <laughs> they hopefully know the answer. <laughs> uh, so um, OCM itself is the open source project inside uh, CNCF, right? Cloud Native Foundation. And then the product Red Hat brought out of is the advanced cluster management, right? 
Um, and normally Red Hat is really good at that. They do open source and then bring products out of it. Um, but I always was confused, and I wanted to see if you guys uh, were more into it, understanding what is the difference between the two. And I know Cluster API was backed by Tanzu and VMware. So other than the rivalry, but about the open source part of these both uh, projects, where do they meet and where do they differentiate? So that's uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, we just don't know. <laughs> no, ju just one clarification. Cluster API is a community project. Uh, and currently, there are 80 companies contributing to it, yes. When is, including, is Red doing, Hat, including Red Hat. In, including Red Hat, Microsoft, and, and many others. So uh, I, I don't have context about the, the, the product, but what I want to make clear that is it is a community project, and everyone is helping to make it possible. Okay, we have another 30 seconds if you have another question. <laughs> 40. Great. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy Kubecon.